Okay, so in, we're continuing our uh, study of the dynamics of systems of particles, and now we're going to go ahead and look at collisions. Okay. In a collision, the idea is we can at least momentarily isolate it, and then we can require that the sum of the momenta before equal the sum of the momenta after. Now, as far as the energy considerations go, the total kinetic energy before um, so kinetic energy of one, kinetic energy of two, energy doesn't have to be conserved. So when we look at it after squared p1 squared over, oops, that should be an equal sign there, over 2 over 2m1 plus p2 prime squared over 2, doggone it, over 2m2. Um, <coughs> the system could gain or lose energy, so we'll keep track of that with our quantity q. If it's energy loss, it's usually to heat, so that's why we picked q. Um, anyway, if q is greater than zero, that would correspond to an energy loss. I call, that's also known as an exergic collision. If Q is equal to zero, then there's no change in energy, and it's an elastic collision. And finally, if Q is less than zero, then that means that the system gained energy So that makes it endoergic. <coughs> Alright, so with that as background, let's go and look at direct collisions. So our momentum conservation equation will become m1x1 dot plus m2x2 dot equals m1 x1 dot prime plus m2 x2 dot prime. And we'll call that star. Now I'm using uh, implicit signs here, so if something's going to the left, that means that the number for the appropriate x dot would be negative. All right, so for now anyway, let's go ahead and assume that the collision is elastic. So that would make Q equal to zero. In that case, our energy conservation will become one half m one x one dot squared. Oops, no primes yet. X one dot squared plus one half m two x two dot squared equals one half m one x one dot prime squared plus one half m one x sorry, m2 x2 dot prime squared. All right, thank God for small favors. The halves cancel. And we'll call that puppy double star. All right. While we're at, let's move our star over there to stay consistent. <coughs> okay, so I can rewrite star a little bit, and I can group the m1s together. I'll get m1 x1 prime dot minus, um, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that one yet. I want to re, so I want to rearrange double star, my bad. So rearranging double star by grouping the m1s, I'll have m1 times x1 prime dot squared minus 
minus without the prime equals minus m2 times the similar expression for the x's. All right. And what I'll do now is I will take that and um, I can factor that m1 x1 dot prime plus x1 dot times x1 dot prime minus x1 dot equals minus m2 and we'll factor that one x2 dot prime plus x2 dot x2 dot prime minus x2 dot alright and then we'll go ahead and take this whole thing and divide it through by our equation star. So that will give me rearranging star there. That's going to give me m1 times x1 dot prime minus x1 dot. And on the other side, I'll be dividing through by minus m2 x2 dot prime minus x2 dot. All right. So cancel, 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 cancel. Whew. All right. So rearranging a bit, we get finally x2 dot prime minus x1 dot prime equals minus x2 dot minus x1 dot. All right, what does that mean? Well, if you look at that, we're saying that the relative, that the velocity of recession is the negative of the velocity of approach. Or you can say the approach and the velocity speeds are the same. Obviously, when you're approaching, it'll be an opposite sign for the velocity than when you're receding. So I could write this a different way, um, which seemingly doesn't isn't that useful, but we'll see that it is. Um, I could rewrite that as 1 is equal to the absolute value of x2 dot prime minus x1 dot prime over the same thing without the primes. All right, now, so that's just the ratio of the speeds. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, what if the collision isn't elastic? If it isn't elastic, then we just replace that one that we got there with something else. So for our general collision. So here I'm allowing for Q to be greater than, equal to, or less than zero. So it can be anything. Anything real, anyway. Um, we can define our coefficient of restitution. Um, epsilon to be that very same ratio of the speeds. Or getting rid of the absolute values to be minus x2 dot prime minus x1 dot prime over the same thing without the primes x2 dot minus x1 dot. Okay, then. So I can rearrange this thought in our previous thing that we had before. Velo velocity of recession is the negative velocity of approach will become that the velocity of recession is minus the coefficient of restitution times the velocity of approach. All right. So with all of that, we can go back to our um, to star, our momentum conservation relation. 
So m1 x1 dot prime plus m2 x2 dot prime equals same thing without the primes. And then we can go ahead and uh, stick in for our uh, x2. So this will become m1 x1 dot prime plus, now here I'm solving this formally for x1 dot prime. So I'm moving this over here, moving that over there, and then I'm going to plug in plus m2 x1 dot prime minus m2 epsilon x2 dot plus m2 epsilon x1 dot equals m1 x1 dot plus m2 x2 dot. All right, and then we can solve that for x1 dot prime. So it'll be equal to m1 minus epsilon m2 x1 dot plus m2 plus epsilon m2 x2 dot over m1 plus m2. So that should look a lot like what you've seen before in undergraduate in lower division mechanics. Um, before we just didn't have the epsilons. And similarly you'll get that x2 dot prime is m1 plus epsilon m1 x1 dot plus m2 minus epsilon m1 x2 dot over m1 plus m2. Cool. And you can go ahead and do your energy conservation. Remember our energy conservation now is going to be 1 half m1 x1 dot squared plus 1 half m2 x2 dot squared equals 1 half m1 x1 dot prime squared plus half m2 x2 dot prime squared plus q. And I will say that it's obvious, so clearly, and you will be assigned to show this, um, you, this eventually transforms into the energy gained or lost is 1 half times the reduced mass V squared, so the kinetic energy, the reduced mass, kind of, um, times 1 minus epsilon squared. Okay, so let's do an example here. Let's look at a perfectly inelastic collision. All right. So initially we've got M1. And, oops. M1, and it's moving to the right at x1 dot, colliding into M2, which is at rest initially. And since it's perfectly inelastic, the coefficient of restitution will be zero. So plugging into our results from before, this gives us x1 dot prime equals M1 over M1 plus M2 x1 dot, and also x2 dot prime equals m1 over m1 plus m2 x1 dot, which I would sincerely hope it was because if it's a perfectly inelastic collision, both things better be moving at the same velocity since they're moving together. All right, and we can work out the energy lost. So that'll be 1 half m1 x1 dot prime squared plus 1 half m2 x2 dot prime squared minus 1 half m1 x1 dot squared. Okay, and we can just put in these results. So we'll do that. 
you get one half times. I'm just pulling out one half from everything because why not? M1, we get an M1 squared. Um, x1 dot squared over m1 plus m2 squared plus m2 times m1 squared over that same quantity squared minus m1 x1 dot squared. Okay, do some algebra on it for a little bit and you eventually get that minus one half m1 m2 over m1 plus m2. Hey, that all look familiar. That's the reduced mass, x1 dot squared. Um, or we can put it another way. If we want to figure out the percentage of energy lost um, by the projectile, we can divide by its um, initial kinetic energy. And that leaves us minus m2 over M1 plus M2. So what does that mean? Well, okay, so if the oncoming projectile is huge, M1's enormous, this is basically zero, so then there'd be basically no energy loss. On the other hand, if it's a flea hitting the Earth, then M1 is basically zero, makes this ratio basically negative one, means you've basically lost all your energy. And if it were 50-50, say the two objects are equally massive atoms, then the one atom loses half the energy. All right, so, or we should say the total kinetic energy drops in half. Okay, so while we're at it here, let's revisit the idea of impulse. So we'll start with Newton's second law, dp dt equals f, which I can rewrite as dp equals f dt. Whoops. Now I'll go ahead and integrate that. So integrating the dp will just give me delta mv, and then I'm left with integral t1 to t2, F D T, which your book calls capital P. So that's the impulse momentum theorem again. This right here is the impulse, and it says the impulse is equal to the change in momentum. Okay, that's all well and good, but um, when we do collisions, Usually, well, I shouldn't say usually, but a lot of times when you do collisions in physics, um, it'll turn out that you'll have one of your targets is at rest, um, and the other one is moving. That's nice, but that turns out to be not the theoretically convenient frame to calculate in. So to that end, we'll go and take a look at lab lab or laboratory and center of mass coordinates. And analyze collisions in each. So the idea goes like this. In many lab situations, although not all, um, we go ahead and fire a projectile into a stationary object M2. Um, assuming we don't have some strange reaction going on or something, that projectile will fly off, M1. That's velocity V1 prime. And M2 flies off at velocity V2 prime. And usually you can expect that the experimentalist can measure this angle phi 1 and that angle phi 2. So this is in the lab frame. Okay. Now, theoreticians prefer instead 
to calculate everything in the center of mass frame. So in the center of mass frame, they imagine that m1 is moving at velocity v1 bar, and m2 is moving with velocity v2 bar. They will go ahead and collide. So they come in here, like so, in, in. And they'll fly out, out, like so. So there's my M1, there's my M2. M1 flies out at V1 bar prime. M2 flies out at V2 bar prime. Okay, now why do theoreticians like the center of mass frame? That's because in the center of mass frame, P1 plus P2 equals zero. And it's also true that P1 bar plus P2 bar um, primed also equals zero. We'll call that triple star. Um, so if we're going to go ahead and do our collision here, the energy considerations become P1 bar squared. So believe it or not, this is enough easier that theoreticians prefer to do this and then boost back to the lab frame at the end, which is what we're doing. P2 bar squared over 2m2 equals P1 bar prime squared over 2m1 plus P2 bar prime squared over 2m2 plus Q. All right, so now from triple star, we can conclude that since P1 is equal to negative P2, you add them together, you get that P1 bar squared equals P2 bar squared, and similarly for the primes. All right, so putting back into the energy conservation then, this becomes, we can pull out a half, and now, since these two terms are equal, we can just call them both P1 bar. So we got 1 over M1 plus 1 over M2, P1 bar squared equals 1 half, 1 over M1 plus 1 over M2, P1 bar prime squared, plus our friend Q. All right, when doubt, you can put things on a common denominator. M1 plus M2 over M1 plus M2. I'm sorry, it should be M1 times M2 down below, of course. Okay, but we recognize that the things in the parentheses are the inverse of the reduced mass. So we'll call this quadruple star. Um, so you get P1 bar squared over 2 mu equals P1 bar prime squared over 2 mu plus Q. This is a very convenient result. So It's a lot easier to, so when you get to your Q from theory or whatever, it's a lot easier to figure this all out in the, uh, um, in the center mass frame. But now we need to figure out how to boost back. So transforming back. And often we call these transformations boosts. So the center of mass velocity, we re remember, be equal to m1v1 over m1 plus m2.
So let's just draw a vector triangle so we remember where we're at. So this is my V1 bar prime here. And then this is my V1 prime in the lab frame. And I would add to this VCM, like so. Um, this angle here would be the phi I measure, phi 1 that I measure in the lab frame. And this angle here would be the theta that I calculated in the center of mass frame. So if we go ahead and look at this, we get V1 prime sine phi 1 equals V1 prime bar sine of theta, right? And so the, from the y components and from the x components, we'll have V1 prime cosine phi 1 equals V1 bar prime cosine theta plus VCM. All right, so we can divide top and bottom through by each other. And so this will give me a tangent of phi 1, dividing these two by each other. Dividing these two by each other will give me, yeah, it's not as clean, sine theta over cosine theta plus VCM over V1 bar prime. All right, <clears throat> now to clean this up a bit, let's give this guy a name, we'll call it Gamma. Um, now this Gamma here, you can also show be equal to M1 V1, M1 plus M2 over my V1 bar prime, that's just putting in the VCM. So this becomes M1 over M1 plus M2 V1 over V1 bar prime. Okay, in any event, we end up with the tangent of phi 1 equaling the sine of theta over gamma plus cosine of theta. And so that's our recipe for boosting back and forth between the frames. Let's go ahead and take a look um, at elastic scattering. In that case, Q is equal to zero. So quadruple star here will yield for us um, P1 bar equals P1 bar prime. So that tells us V1 bar prime equals V1 bar. Now we have that V1 bar is equal to M2 over M1 plus M2 V1. That gives us gamma being M1 over M2, M1 plus M2 times V1 over M2 over M1 plus M2 V1. All right, cancel palooza. Cancel, 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 cancel. And I'm left with gamma being M1 over M2 for, for elastic scattering. So let's just do a quick application of this. Um, let's look at the case of elastic scattering where M1 is much less than M2. So we said that the tangent of phi 1 is equal to sine theta over gamma plus cosine theta, right? We just worked out 
that gamma is m1 over m2. So say if we go ahead and do an electron off, say, a hydrogen atom, um, that's going to give me a gamma of about one two thousandth. So in that case, we get that the tangent of my phi 1 is approximately my tangent of theta, which is perfectly fine because in a typical electron scattering experiment for atoms, um, your detector probably only discriminates to a few degrees. And so this little factor of 1 2 thousandth isn't really going to matter much. Okay, let's look at another application here. So also elastic scare, but this time it's m1 equals m2. So say two billiard balls. So clearly gamma is equal to one in that case. So the tangent of um, phi one is equal to the sine of theta over gamma plus cosine theta equals sine of theta over one plus cosine theta. And if you're really good with your trig identities, um, you remember that you can write the sine of theta as two sine theta over two cosine theta over two and one plus cosine theta you can write as two cosine squared of theta over two yeah I just looked it up myself cancel 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 and you're left with tangent of theta over two all right so that's cool, but now let's look at the case where the collision is what we call deeply inelastic. And just for discussion, let's keep it like m1 equals m2. So this could correspond to, say, a high energy um, a high energy particle collision. For instance, you ram one proton really hard into a fixed target and it winds up just finding another proton and colliding. So in our lab frame, we'll have that V2 bar will equal V1 bar equals one half V1 just from our previous result. So we have P1 bar squared over, over 2 mu equals P1 prime bar squared over 2 mu plus Q. All right. So we'll put in what that is. That's mv1 bar squared over 2. And our reduced mass is half the mass of one particle. Um, but we got two of, sorry, half the mass of two particles, so cancel, cancel, reduce mass is mass of one particle. Same deal here. Uh, um, oops, that's m squared there. Um, m squared v1 bar prime squared over 2 times 2m over 2, cancel, cancel. For what it's worth, we can also cancel one power of m, and we've got a plus q there. All right, so we get that, um, I'm sorry, I'm my bad here. It, it reduced mass is just m over 2. Those are the twos that cancel. All right, so we're left with q equals m times v1 bar squared minus v1 prime bar squared. 
So our maximum energy loss will be mv1 bar squared. Um, if we're colliding off a stationary object, or if we wind up having a totally inelastic collision, sorry. Um, so this would be m times one half v1 squared is one quarter mv1 squared, or one half of the kinetic energy. So the moral of the story here is in a fixed target experiment, you waste half the energy in recoil. <sighs> That's all right at lower energies, and there's some advantages. Um, so a lot of nuclear experiments are still done this way. But for high energy particle physics, that's just an utterly unacceptable loss when you're talking about hooking up your accelerator to basically you know, the output of an entire nuclear reactor just to keep it going. So in that case, um, what they do in high energy physics experiments is they go ahead and they actually do the really hard work of getting two counter-rotating beams to collide into each other so that the they're working in the center of mass frame and there is no energy loss or you don't lose half the energy just due to recoil. In any case you can show the general case gamma is m1 over m2 times 1 minus q over the kinetic energy times 1 plus m1 over m2 all raised to the negative one half. Okay, in the next video we'll take a look at the motion of a body with a variable mass.